All right, hello everyone. Welcome, we're uh, just getting everybody in from the waiting room right now. So bear with me for a moment. Seeing lots of familiar faces there. All right, so uh, welcome to another edition of Online Artist Talks presented by the Maloof. I am Seth Pringle, Program Manager at the Sam and Alfreda Maloof Foundation for Arts and Crafts. And we're very happy to have you with us for today's talk with CJ Jillick. Um, we've been doing these uh, for, I think this is a uh, number seven weekly on, on Fridays. Since we uh, had to close our doors, we're hoping to reopen very soon. So stay tuned for uh, any announcements we have about uh, reopening plans. But in the meanwhile, we are happy to have everybody join us uh, online here for these artist talks. Uh, and they're an extension of an exhibition we have in our gallery uh, of photographs of artists, local artists in their homes and studios. And so we are joining our artists uh, for these artist talks, uh, artists from that photo exhibition. So uh, in case you're new to Zoom, uh, you can adjust your view in the top right uh, corner of your screen. You're probably gonna want uh, the gallery view, or I mean, uh, speaker view, sorry. You might have it on gallery view, but you'll probably want it on speaker view. And then if you look at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a little uh, chat box. If you open the chat box, you can type questions for CJ anytime throughout the talk. Uh, pop, you know, question pops in your head, just type it in there. And we'll get to the questions at the end uh, after the presentation, uh, we'll, we'll uh, do some Q&A, so stick around for that. Um, and then if you need to leave the meeting, uh, there's a little button in the bottom right if you uh, want to end in case you're still learning the Zoom platform here. Uh, so a little bit about CJ Jillick. Uh, she got her uh, BFA from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale and her MFA from Utah State University at Logan. Uh, she is currently a professor of ceramic art at uh, Saddleback College, Mount San Antonio College, and Chafee College. She's been a presenter at Australia's International Clay Conference and has taught at many institutions, including the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, Carbondale Clay Center, the Clay House, American Museum of Ceramic Art, uh, the Color, uh, Colorado Mountain College, Chapman University, and she's shown her work uh, at galleries and museums throughout the United States and Australia. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to CJ. Hello, CJ. Hi, thanks for coming everybody. This is exciting. So I thought today that I would do a little uh, travel log of my clay adventures over the years. I'm getting a little stir crazy because I normal tra normally travel all the time and I haven't been able to. So I thought we'll do a little recap of what I've done over the years and it should take us a little bit outside of our current little homes that we've been in for so many weeks now. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you so that you can get a larger image of the slides I'm going to be presenting. So there we go. Everyone should be seeing my title slide now. That's good. Good. All right. So here we go. So as Seth had said, I did start out uh, in Illinois. So I was born just outside of Chicago. And um, I started off in two dimensional arts, actually. And I started that uh, real young in a, a community college. And when I transferred out to my four-year college, I fell right into ceramics immediately. And I knew from the very first class I took that ceramics was going to definitely be the rest of my life. 
And I was really lucky to have amazing professors and fellow grad students at that school. Um, Southern Illinois University is known for multiple mediums, ceramics, glass blowing, blacksmithing, fine metals, jewelry, textiles, you name it, they had it, which was an amazing undergrad program. And I tried everything. I refused to leave until I had a little bit of everything under my belt. And uh, while I was there, I met a gentleman who was originally from California. And um, he had been actually from uh, the area of Big Bear. And he had crossed paths a few times with Paul Solner. And when he saw the work I was making, he's like, you know, I really think you need to try out this low fire salt technique. And so this is my work from my solo BFA show in Illinois. And it is a low fire salt technique. I'm not going to bore you guys with a lot of clay detail because I'm a ceramics geek and I love to go into formulas and all the technical things, but I'm not sure everyone's a clay person here, so we'll keep it to overall expansive ideas of clay. So um, at this point in time, my interest in clay had to do with um, the clay itself. I used to mix up different kinds of clay to have different size particulate matter in it so that when I even drag a wire through it, you know, that, that residue from that dragging particulate would leave a texture on the clay. And I thought that that was fascinating. And when you stretched and expanded clay, you would get these beautiful expansion marks and cracks and surfaces. So I was so in love with the clay that I didn't want to cover it up with any kind of glaze. I wanted the clay itself to ring true. And that's why I was so in love with the low fire salt process. A lot of the colors on these pieces are coming from the materials that were in the kiln that fumed, that left a mark or a halo on the pieces themselves. The more linear patterns that I was able to achieve are done through um, wrapping the piece with copper wire. And as the copper wire was introduced to the fire in the kiln, it itself would fume and the clay body would absorb the fuming from the copper wire. So having this, this just soft fuming color on top of that working clay texture was really my goal of the time. Now at the same time that I was doing this, that same person had his, um, his little ear, you know, my ear was to him and he was talking to me and he was telling me all about this other process that I needed to learn. And so I kind of had that in the back of my head, all these different clay processes he was telling me about. And we had, of course, amazing artists coming through the university. And so one artist came through and he introduced me to what are called drape molds. So all of my work um, for years and years and years have been produced through drape molds. And so what you can see here is this, um, this mold process is very simple. It's a piece of thin masonite or maybe a piece of plywood with just a simple shape cut out of it. And then you roll out your clay slab and you drape your clay through. So you can see in the upper left hand corner, that's where the clay is sitting on top of the mold and it has draped through. And then there's another one in front that I flipped it over just so you could see what it would look like from the other side. So now it looks like a dome through that hole. And you just remove the piece of wood and then you cut off all the extra clay and then you can build with those pieces. And that's how I was constructing all of my work up until this point. And this process has served me so well over the years. I've worked with it um, in a smooth style and finish. And I've also um, really worked up the surfaces on that clay that I'm pushing through the mold. And we're going to see that throughout the slideshow. So as my friend Kirk was uh, continually telling me about all these processes, he told me, oh, you have to go fire this kiln. I helped build a kiln in Northern California. So this is the kiln. And I love this kiln. I fired this kiln for over 10 years. And, um, and eventually, this is exactly the reason, this kiln right here is why I moved to California from Illinois. And I fell in love with the kiln. I fell in love with the wood fire process. And that de designed my path for the next um, 10 years, for sure, maybe more. So I brought my same technique out with me and um, I was still building with those drape molds. You can see the similar shapes that I was using, 
um, but my texture is starting to increase, right? What I'm learning is that now that I'm working with a wood fire process, which builds up a lot of wood ash on the surface, my very subtle textures were starting to get obliterated by the amount of the wood ash that was building up. So I thought, well, I got to do a little something about this. And I started engaging with the surface even more and, and pushing and expanding and working with the clay to produce these even deeper textures. And so um, you can see here, I love this piece. The, the mark um, going down the center of the belly of this piece is from the interior structure of a cactus after it's dried out. So I was always investigating. I was looking at nature. I was looking at man-made products, all different things to create my surface textures. And at the time, my inspiration for the layout and the pattern of the textures was based on the fact that I had been flying back and forth between California and Illinois quite often to see my family. And I was captivated with how the landscape changes and when you see it from an aerial point of view, um, just these incredible patterns that develop as you, you know, zoom across the top of the sky and look down on our man-made world and how we influence the land and um, these areas of nature and, and man-made patterns. I just find those fascinating. So I was working with those ideas and um, I couldn't get a job up in Chico. I was working in a used bookstore and a a fish market and um, a coffee house, all kinds of places. And um, someone had told me, you know, you should really move down to Santa Barbara. And so I did. And I was lucky enough to live just to the right of that tree at the point of that cliff right there. It was a beautiful place to live. And while I lived there, I ended up getting a job working for the Santa Barbara Museum of Arts offsite education facility. And I was able to help develop a ceramics program for them where we were teaching both children and adults. And um, it was a low fire program. So the direct opposite of what I was doing in my own personal work. So I was really learning a lot about material at the time and a lot about projects and repairing kilns and wheels and everything it takes to run a program. And at the same time, um, my partner was running a construction company. And the next thing I knew, bits and pieces from the construction company started entering into my work. So some of the textures now in my work are reminiscent or even developed from tools that I was finding on job sites. Um, I started framing out my work, um, which I think was directly influenced by being around so many buildings that were being constructed at the time and, and seeing the framing of the buildings and then the fine cabinetry and how that was all worked in and, and built into these really beautiful homes in Santa Barbara. And so it all started to culminate. So I'm still wood firing the work. I'm still looking for these deeper, uh, more intense textures that are going to stand up in the wood fire. I have this framed out system around the forms, but I'm still traveling and I'm just getting more and more captivated with how the mountains look from the plains. When you're looking down that, that pattern and the grooves and the undulation of, you know, the main ridge of the mountain, which then breaks down into the next ridge, which breaks down into the next ridge. And I thought, well, there's got to be a way to get some of this onto the pots. And sometimes when you fly over, this is a mine in Utah that I fly over quite often. And just that little bit more of man-made versus the natural terrain of these mountains is just captivating to me. So that eventually made it back into the work as well. So you can see here, the textures are getting much, much deeper. Um, when I finished working with this particular style of work, I think there were areas on that that clay slab that was close to two inches thick and um, really building that undulation and, and defining that surface texture and then framing it out with that juxtaposition of the, the, the harsh, clean, crisp lines. And so I spent a couple years working in this style and I also love engineering. I love how things work and how things go together. And I found myself wanting to engineer more and more with my pieces. So this piece here looks like a simple covered box, right? Um, but it's designed to open up and be a vase that's low so you can still talk over the flowers at the dinner table. 
And then when it's not in use, you put it back together and it's a finished covered box on your shelf until you're ready to use it again. And you can see this, the, the highly exaggerated texture on the surface. I, I particularly love that, that piece. Um, another one, um, this is my asparagus tray. So all my pieces had a particular function in mind. And um, I found it really disappointing because so few people would use my work. They really saw it as sculpture. And they didn't want to um, you know, purchase the work and then jeopardize breaking it by using it. But for me, you know, it was so important that it be used for the function and how I engineered it to work. So that gave me some things to think about. And at that point in time, I decided that I was gonna go up to Mendocino, California and do a residency program and, and spend some time thinking about, you know, what do I want the function of my work to be and it, how important is it? So I spent some time at the Mendocino Arts Center and walking those beautiful headlands around Mendocino. If, if you haven't been up there, it's just an incredibly beautiful, magical area um, with the caves along the headlands and on low tide. The tide pools are just teeming with life and texture. Um, as you go up the coast towards Fort Bragg, there's uh, the Mendocino Botanical Gardens. And I decided to go and adventure around the Botanical Gardens one day. And I stumbled across this. And I thought this was just the most beautiful plant structure I had seen in a while. It looked, um, it looked like a plant out of, you know, the days of the dinosaurs. It just, it captivated my mind and there was so much color and so many layers of texture in it. And I just thought, oh, I've, I've got to keep this in mind. And that moment in that botanical garden with that plant kind of started to set me on a new path. But I wasn't quite sure the parameters of it yet. So in the studio in Mendocino, the first thing that came out from the experience was more of the look of the tide pools coming out in the work, look of coral or, um, you know, different little amoebas and different um, barnacles and things like that started developing and showing in the work. And again, that man-made structure, I've just always loved that, that contrast between man-made and the earth. And as you get out there and you hike around California, you know, you see it so often where we're trying to hold back hillsides or we're trying to irrigate water in a certain path to preserve um, an area that's eroding. And you'll often see these metal um, culverts or corrugated tin that's holding back different areas of the land. And I just always found that so interesting. And, in that we try so hard to hold it back, but we never can, right? So there's always that movement and that decay and that deterioration of what we're trying to hold the earth back with. And so I just wanted to investigate and push those contradictions a little bit further. And I was still in my land of engineering, in my brain. So here is a piece that I thought, you know, on plants, we so often look at just the bloom, but the stems can be beautiful as well. So here I framed out the stems by having an opening in this space. So you see the stems through that interior structure and you see the blooms coming out the top of the form. Another piece that I engineered while I was in Mendocino is this fruit bowl. And so this is um, based off of one of those culverts that you would see when you're out hiking. And I created a an extruder template that was going to extrude this piece of clay with that same spiraling pattern that our man-made irrigation culverts have. And you can see that both through the top and um, right through the center of the bowl. So after I finished up my residency, I decided that um, it would be a good idea to go to grad school. And so I applied to about five different grad schools and while I was waiting for the applications to come in, I was a full-time art installer, and I got to travel the world, not the world yet, actually just the country so far, um, to install art. And every time I would go to a new part of the country to install, I would get into whatever botanical garden I could find nearby. So these shots are from a botanical garden in Coral Gables, uh, Florida. 
and um, I'm sure you've all seen some of these plants before, but they're such beautiful structures, right? Here's the bloom of a banana flower. This is one not everyone's seen before. This is the flower of a cannonball tree, and I just love the structure of this piece. It's, it's both incredibly soft, and yet part of that stamen that's coming out towards us in this image is firm like a succulent plant would be. So it's interesting, these two textures in this one particular bloom. So that was a wonderful find in Florida. And when I got back from Florida, I found out that I did get into grad school and that I was going to be off to Utah. So Utah was a fantastic experience. It was my first choice in grad schools. Um, as a grad school, it's particularly well known for um, all of its work and study that it does with wood-fired ceramics. But I had decided, even before applying there, that after my thought of my residency in Mendocino and um, how people were not using my utilitarian forms, I decided, well, maybe I'm just hiding behind them and it might be time to go sculptural. And so I decided that Utah State was going to be my first choice of schools because I would be able to go sculptural, as well as the professors there are so well known for how much they know about the material itself. And so I put myself to the task when I got to Utah to test a new clay body every week. So my whole first semester, I was making my own clay bodies. And um, another semester, I tested glazes, um, more glaze testing than most people do in a lifetime. And, um, and I really just thought, the more I know my material, the further I can push my material. I firmly believe that. So a lot of testing, a lot of investigation. So my first semester, playing around with different kinds of clay, um, this particular piece is a detail where I was using colored clay to actually build with rather than putting color on top of the clay. Going back to that same idea as in undergrad, you know, I don't need to cover it up with a glazed surface. I can just build with the color in the clay. And then I wanted to play with the idea of the different sheens of the glaze against the colored clays. So here's the back side of that piece. And so the whole first semester was just a lot of research. And one of the other great things about the Utah State program is that they have an amazing study abroad. And so my first one was to Australia. So I head off to Australia for six months. And I photo I'm there for six months and I took 6,000 images of plants. So the plant research is definitely coming into play. So we'll just buzz through a couple images here so you can see the structures of some of the plants that I'm looking at in Australia. We've got amazing color, we've got texture, we've got structure, so much material to build from. And then I started making work in Australia. And so in, it was in Australia where I definitely flipped from utilitarian to the sculptural work. Not quite knowing exactly where I was going to go with the work yet, but making that transition over. So using a lot of that texture, a lot of that detail, and now starting to play around with color. Um, I liked the texture that I was getting, but the one thing I was missing in some of these pieces is they felt so rooted, so stable. And I felt that with the work, it needed to be a little bit more animated. And so this was a maquette that I did just before I left Australia. And I was just starting to get to that idea of how can I animate the forms? How can I get them to have that feeling that, you know, if we looked away, they would actually get up and move. And here, you know, you can see I'm still hanging on to some literal ideas. I've got the soil clump underneath the taller structure there. You can still see the roots over on the structure on the right. But it's that I'm starting to break away. And then it was time to go back to the cold and snowy Utah. So I left Australia in the peak of summer. It was hotter than anyone could believe and so humid. And I came back to Utah and it was 10 below zero. 
and there was this major snowstorm. I couldn't even get to any of my clothes. So I locked myself in the studio, um, tried to go out as little as possible, and um, was still living out of my two suitcases from Australia. So um, layering up all these clothes just to stay warm, my summer clothes. So locked myself in, and this is what I created for the next semester. So this piece is, again, playing off of that maquette, trying to get animation into the work. And it's a major change of scale. So the piece on the left here is about five feet tall, and it has that branch that's coming out from the form actually uh, moves. So you can and tap that branch, and it'll move around as if it's blowing in the wind. And then the piece on the right is another exploration of materials. So um, I've by now started using flocking and the red on that particular form is a two part rubber that they use in uh, the special effects of movie making. Just trying to experiment with materials and push that as far as I can. And then I decided to do another study abroad off to Korea now in Korea, you know, there's so much traditional, um, traditional ungi pots, traditional imagery, pattern, texture, architecture, so much to learn. And one of the main thing I, things I learned in Korea was the sense of display of what you can go, what extremes you can go to to display your work. Um, I think often as potters, we tend to just take our piece in and put it on a white pedestal and we call it good. And I just learned from looking at these different installations of work in Korea that you can go so much further. You can build an environment for your work and you can set the atmosphere for how you want people to see your work. So this particular show is based off the elements, so light, water, earth, etc. So in this slide here, those pieces are actually displayed in water and you can see a reflection of those pieces. And after China, we popped over to China, or after Korea, we popped over to China. And um, more of traditional imagery. And um, we also stopped off in their contemporary art district, which was quite interesting. And you're seeing textures and forms that you're going to see again here in my work soon. And then I decided it was time to get back to grad school and get my MFA done. So I went back to grad school and I started slip casting my work, which is a new process for me. And what I liked about slip casting was I was able to create a visual language, a, a visual vocabulary of forms that were going to be signature CJ forms, where when you saw that piece, you would know most likely that was created by CJ. So you're going to see through this work a repetition of these forms. So here on the right, um, this piece is called the Odalesque in the Voyeur. And uh, that form on the right, I use it in many, many of my pieces, but I change the angle and the direction in which I use that form. Sometimes it's the top of a bloom, sometimes it's the main structural part. Um, so all these pieces are slip cast out of porcelain, surfaced with um, different materials, mostly under glazes, some glazes, some flocking, some rubber, um, all different types of materials all culminated together to come together for my MFA show. And I brought in a little of that display method that I was learning in Korea and being so inspired by. So this was my MFA show. And since my work is so small in this show, I thought, you know, I need to find a way to focus people's attention. And so the gallery was very, very dark, and there was one hot spotlight on each pedestal. And so you really had to walk up. You had to approach the work and spend a little time with it. You couldn't just do a big sweeping glance of the gallery because it wasn't lit well enough for that, right? So you came up, you investigated, you spent some time with each piece. And so we'll flip through a few images here of the MFA show. You can see some of the repeated forms. Here's a piece that's displayed in water, so you can see the reflection of that piece. On these particular pieces, I like the fact that the pieces didn't actually touch in real life, but when you look at the reflections in the water, it does appear like the pieces are actually touching. 
So from my MFA show, um, I was excited. I was moving to Colorado in order to do a residency at the Carbondale Clay Center. But before I could even get to Colorado, I was invited to Poland, literally, as I'm driving from one state to the other. So I thought it was just a piece of, you know, junk email. And, um, and I was thinking about it the whole time I was driving from one state to the other. And I get to Colorado and I email. And sure enough, it was the real deal. So 10 days later, I was standing in Poland. And I was doing this symposium where they invite you over. And you get to work in a traditional Polish ceramics factory. See, not a lot of people would want to do that. But I found it fascinating. So we got to show up. And they put us up in a nunnery, and we each had a factory that we would go to. And this is the type of work that they make in Poland. So it's a lot of traditional wares, traditional tablewares, um, utilizing underglazes that they actually stamp onto the work rather than uh, paint with brushes. It's almost all stamping. And they're laser cutting all of these stamps to create the patterns, which I thought was fascinating. So. It was great, it was exciting. I got to just walk into this factory every day and I had as much slip cast material as I could ever dream of right there, pumped to the studio I was working in. And it all culminated in a festival at the end of the summer where we were allowed to come out and sell our works. We did an alternative firing in the park and they do a parade of um, living statues where everyone goes to the op shop and gets some old fancy dress and they get doused in casting slip from head to toe and they go out and they parade through the town in their their casting slip as living sculptures it's, it's very eye-catching so this is the factor one of the factories i was working in the one above was my factory it was the art factory and the one below is the pipe factory and each there were 13 artists and we each had a space in some factory in the town and then we all stayed together and um, would commute com um, communicate and hang out uh, in the nunnery in the evenings and um, it was quite inspiring it's fascinating here's some of the uh, imagery that I was catching around town as I walked around and some of the pieces that I produced And a few more images from that parade because I just found the outfits so dynamic. And then it was back to Colorado. So I got back to Colorado and I lived in the small town of Carbondale, which is in the Aspen Valley. And I was installing artwork professionally and working here from the Carbondale Clay Studio, continuing my investigation of slipcast forms, pushing the multimedia a little bit further. So um, introducing other fun materials, um, continuing to carve, continuing to use underglaze, pushing that idea of that vocabulary. And the snow kicked in. And it snowed and it snowed and it snowed and it snowed. I'm not a snow person. That's what I learned. So I had to run off to Australia to get away from the snow. I had to go somewhere where I knew it absolutely would not snow. And I thought Perth would be the perfect place. And it, it was true. It was amazing in Perth. The, the ocean, the sky. The ocean is so clean there that you can see straight through to the tide pools. It, it's, it's phenomenal. I, I can't even express to you what it's like to stand at the ocean um, on Western Australia coast. And, and be able to just see how clear and clean everything is. It's something we don't experience here in California. And they also have amazing, beautiful botanicals to be inspired by. And while I was there, I was, um, I was hired to start the Clay House. So this was a residency program and a community school for children and adults. Um, it was started by Fleur Shell and she wanted me to come in and set it up and get it running. So when I walked in, there were no tables or chairs even in the building. Um, came in, set the whole studio up, and four days later was teaching a full round of classes. So it was an intense run the entire time I was there, but a great experience. I lived right there in the studio. I was 
sold work from the studio. We ran the classes and workshops from the studio. It was a seven day a week job, but I still squeaked out a little time to make stuff. And I started doing these, this line of uh, vessels that had this intense um, texture pattern on the surface of them. And that was inspired from these tools here. So I love when I can use a complete man-made mechanical tool to create something that references organic natural forms, right? It's a nice contradiction. These tools here are actually um, old, old orthopedic surgery tools for um, grinding out joints. So it was interesting, some of the things I found while I was in Australia, and I'm always looking everywhere for something that's gonna make really great texture and pattern. So here's the body of work that I produced while I was in Australia. Um, here I'm utilizing uh, uh, raw wool that I um, flocked and, um, and then felted to create this stamen structure. You can see the traditional forms and vocabulary. And then the next thing I knew, visa ended, so it was back to the States. And so before I knew it, I'm in Pomona, California. Quite a change from Perth, Australia. Um, but I'm in Pomona and um, never actually thought I'd settle down here in this area that's so rich with ceramic tradition. Some of you may recognize this piece from Pasadena. Nice viola fry. Um, not only ceramic tradition, amazing plant structures to be inspired by. And I was working for AMOCA, American Museum of Ceramic Art, and started creating my work here. And at this point is when I was invited to be at uh, the sculpture show, Sculpture in the Garden at Maloof. And, um, and nobody thought I made large enough work for a sculpture show in a garden, but I proved them wrong and I whipped out a nice large piece for that show. Um, and I also um, started a jewelry line, so I was kind of working both ends of the spectrum at the same time. So I created uh, these molds and these small scale elements to create the jewelry line. Continued with the vessel forms. but also produced a large scale piece for the Maloof Garden. And even when I'm working large scale, you know, that idea of more is more really layering texture on top of structure, um, getting a real depth of information, and then applying painted surfaces over the top that add yet another layer of information is what I'm always going for with my work. So it's a really a more equals more equals more is a good thing and that bright color. And here's another piece. Uh, this one I believe is from 2017 now. And uh, this piece is pushing that idea of the animation. So I've actually, since the Maloof piece, stopped um, slip casting so much and I've moved back into hand building each piece individually. And although I'm walking away from that visual vocabulary, I am engaging more of the animation. So I want there to feel like there's more movement in the forms. You'll notice I don't use roots or any kind of um, element that's gonna really push that idea of grounded or planted. You know, I wanna push that idea of, you know, what's gonna happen when we turn the lights off in the gallery and we walk away for the night, you know, a little, little shop of horrors feel. And then I always try to give my viewers the benefit of if you come up close to the work, you should be rewarded, right, for your effort and your time and your willingness to investigate. And so I always have incredibly small, fine details. So on the left, I have the uh, millinery elements from the Czech Republic. These are vintage elements that they used to use in ladies' hat making. And I research and find them around the world and buy them and I use them as the stamens. And on the right, when you get up really close to that particular leg of that sculpture, there's a 
layer of fuzz, white fuzz through in between all that other texture. So it's just a nice element for when you get up close and you really get to investigate the work, you get a little reward for that. And my current work is, um, this is a maquette for my new work, which I'm trying to uh, create forms that live on these, these cloud shelves. And my creatures are hopefully going to start trying to uh, stretch and reach and climb from one cloud to the next. So we're gonna attempt that the next time I'm in the studio. And my latest set of travels, just in case you guys, you know, feel like you're ready to start planning your next escape. Um, last summer I went to Bali and taught a workshop there and it was just amazing because again, so much color, so many visual um, structures and inspiration and architecture and sculpture. Um, there's just so much to be inspired by. And as they say in um, Bali, everything grows in Bali. So you can see this uh, rice terrace on the right. Um, you know, it has growth on top of growth. And, you know, when they're doing their festivals in Bali, they use the huge magnolia blooms to decorate everything. So here they've lined all the steps with full, huge magnolia blooms. Or not magnolias, uh, marigolds, sorry, marigold blooms. Um, here, the sculpture on the left is from the, um, water temple so you would go and you would be blessed in the water at this temple but i just think it's such a beautiful sculpture and for most of their festivals all the sculptures get decorated with marigolds as well and they have the offerings they give offerings about five times a day um, on a normal day and almost all day on a festival day so all the um, sculptures get their their offerings and their decorations and there's just so much color and you can see on the sculpture on the right, because everything grows in Bali, even the stone starts to grow moss and lichen. And so even the stone sculptures start to have this layer of growth and organics on them. And here is just a, an image of color and pattern and texture. They do amazing structures out of bamboo there, um, which is really fun to investigate the engineering behind those. And I did have to work while I was there a little bit. So I taught a workshop for Gaia Ceramic Studio. And they have a beautiful um, studio that's open walls, but this beautiful bamboo and thatched roof. And you get to work in this outdoor environment the whole time. It's just incredible. So my friend Carol and I taught the workshop together. We had about 15 people. Here you can see the, the beautiful studio and we used to eat lunch up on that upper deck and um, the other half of us would eat over on this side patio near the gallery and the workshop was for biomorphic forms so um, I was showing people how to do some of the different textures and forms that I create while I was there and that's what I'll be continuing to do in the future. So um, both in my studio here, investigating my new cloud sculptures with the animals or creatures trying to climb between them. Um, I'll be utilizing all my surfaces and colors and texture and try to get that animation to continue to grow along the way. And hopefully when COVID's over, I'll be back out there on the road doing workshops and traveling around. So that's a, a quick tour of a few parts of the world I've been to. Um, a, a couple images of all of the plant research I do because I photograph plants everywhere I go and, um, and some of the ceramic work that I enjoy to make. So I wanna thank you for being here and um, we'll take some questions now. All right, thank you, CJ. Uh, so speaking of your plant research, uh, do you grow plants yourself? <laughs> no, funny enough, um, uh, give me a plant, it is a death sentence for that plant. I have to make ceramic plants so that they are CJ tolerant. And they're also drought tolerant if you'd like to get one for your garden. 
like yeah whenever i'm growing plants and many of them die i always say that they weren't yeah they weren't seth tolerant uh <laughs> they didn't meet that standard right, so uh we have a, a question from rebecca she says your floral organic sculptures are so sensual and often seem biological in nature is this intentional on your part absolutely yes um i wanted to um when I started doing the work that was super sexy in Utah, um, I did want to push that idea of um, human, it's kind of a metaphor for human sexuality. Um, so the anatomy is there, as well as the um, ideas of attraction um, and desire and eroticism and hopefully acceptance. Um, I found coming from California where we are quite open and free going to utah was a little bit of a shock and um it, i felt like we needed a little little mind opening acceptance <laughs> so um it was actually a very shocking show in utah and they were gonna rate it um at, at what nc 17 or something like that they were gonna have a rating at the door um to uh protect people from my show <laughs> wow that's, that's pretty interesting. And that was what year? Uh, that was two. The show was two thousand and ten. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> when we uh, often kind of live in the in the art world, and we uh, forget how easily people can be uh, shocked. Still. We do. We do. And um, and you know, it was interesting because when you go to another culture like that, you often you know, there's usually two reactions to it. And one is to like shock them as much as you possibly can. And so I was there with other artists that were taking that route. And, um, and I actually was taking the bees to honey route. So um, by actually integrating that idea of sexuality in with the plants, um, I was actually giving it to them in a much more acceptable palette. You know, plants often put their sexuality right there for us to see. So it's acceptable. And so um, it actually went over much better um, than I thought it would have by doing it that way. And um, I actually had a really um, funny story at my MFA show. A woman walked up to me and, and she waited a long time to get my attention. And she says, honey, do, do you make these things? And I said, yes, yes, I do. And she goes, can I ask you a question? I said, yes, yeah. Do you eat strange fruit before you go to bed at night? Well, I had just traveled Korea and China and Australia and New Zealand, and I'm like, well, do I eat strange fruit before I go to bed at night? And I'm literally thinking about the question, and I said, no, I don't think I do. And she goes, oh, I was going to tell you to keep eating it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we have uh, a question from uh, Marie. She's noticing uh, what looks like a large collection of vinyl behind you, and she's wondering if there's a connection between art and music for you. Um, I love music, but actually this collection of vinyl, um, I have been teaching my three college classes from my dining room, and this is my partner's vinyl collection behind me. <laughs> we will be building a studio for me in the next month so that I can actually teach ceramics not in the dining room for the next semester. <laughs> well, I was curious about the piece that you made for the Maloof sculpture in the garden show and since you and, and seeing your work amidst the plants and it sounds like you you know you made the piece knowing that it was going to be in the the garden i was wondering if you were it changed your your thought process to know that your piece would be sitting amongst the plants uh you know um yes and no um i it was funny because i picked my spot in the garden i believe it was november and Seth had taken me on an incredible tour and I knew exactly what color everything in the near vicinity was going to bloom and the whole scenario. And, um, and then I went to the studio and I started making and 
I did my research and I collected exactly what plants I was going to morph together to create the sculpture and had put all that together and come, I think it must have been March or April that I started glazing the work. I knew I was supposed to put purple on it, but I couldn't remember why. I was like, I know there's a reason I was going to use purple. Purple's important. And I kept like wanting to walk away from the purple, but then I kept going, no, 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 I have to use the purple for some reason. And, uh, and so I finished the whole piece and I had the uh, purple um, pattern on the top of the lower one that sits to the right. And sure enough, it's because the, the foliage that was in front of my piece came up in this beautiful purple bloom and it played off beautifully in May when the piece was installed. So to that aspect, I had planned for the foliage that was around, but um, the plants that actually inspired that piece were um, a, a Cape chestnut tree and a couple different orchids. And um, I believe, no, that one doesn't have Banksia. So a few different orchids. Yeah. Nice. It, it seems like your, your color palette has evolved over time and it seems like it's getting uh, kind of like hyper real in the more recent work. Yeah, it's very hyper, hyper intense atomic colors. Um, I do sometimes miss my black though. I really liked the uh, black in the work to give it a visual foundation because I was taking all the roots and the stems away and I wanted to, the work to look animated. I felt like the black gave it just enough grounding and foundation visually. Um, so I sometimes miss having some of the black as that foundation in the work, but I do love my atomic colors because, you know, when you start researching those plants in nature, it's just amazing what they do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I have a question from um, Moni, I believe, uh, asking about uh, larger scale work and uh, if you have more interest in that in the future uh, as a potential for so much detail. Uh, so you, you made some larger work. Uh, do you have plans for, for doing more larger work? It looks like we might have lost CJ. Oh, 